I'd like you to meet Jalen Cruz. He's a third grade student at Urban Preparatory Academy in Wichita. Jalen came to Urban Prep after two years in the public school system, and he arrived with behavior problems, low personal self-esteem, and a, perhaps not coincidentally, a low reading score. He tested in only the 24th percentile in reading nationwide. Now, less than a year later, he's in the 78th percentile in reading and math. He's made a lot of new friends, and he even has a great career goal. He wants to be like Pastor Wade Moore the headmaster at Urban Prep. Now, Jalen is a, unfortunately a rare exception. You see, he's only able to attend Urban Prep because of a tax credit scholarship. That's the only school choice program available to low-income families in Kansas. And without this program, Jalen would still be among the tens of thousands of students who are left behind every year. Now, that's just my opinion, but it's based on careful review of all of the information. And you haven't had that opportunity so you shouldn't just accept my opinion, or that of anyone else for that matter, including educators, legislators, or other policy experts. You've only had access to partial information, so today I'd like to share some new information with you so that you'll be in a position where you can make your own fully informed decision as to whether outcomes are acceptable today or whether major change is needed in the system. And then you have to assume ownership of your decision. You see, the future of education is really in your hands. Local school boards and state legislators only do what you allow them to do. So if you believe after your review that change is needed, but you don't share that with them, well, then you have to assume ownership of your failure to act. Now, let's get started with the new information. The National Assessment of Educational Progress is considered the gold standard of measuring outcomes and it's administered by the U.S. Department of Education, and the Kansas Department of Education says measurement on NAEP is both valid and reliable. Now, unfortunately, the 2015 NAEP results showed that low-income students in Kansas are two to three years worth of learning behind their more affluent peers, and those gaps have gotten worse over the last 10 years. Now, state proficient, or proficiency levels on NAEP are, in my opinion, unfortunately very low. Less than a quarter of low-income students are proficient in reading and math, and only about half of students who are more affluent are proficient. Now, we used to measure the time it would take to close achievement gaps. That's getting the low-income kids to the current level of those who are not low-income. We used to measure that gap in decades. Now, after 10 years and $2 billion later, we have to measure those gaps in closing them in centuries. Now, education lobbyists will tell you that Kansas has some very high national rankings, but unfortunately the data doesn't comport with that. In fact, a prestigious national publication, Education Week, this year looked at these same NAEP results and gave Kansas a D in student achievement. Now, you didn't hear that because unfortunately local media ignored that January press release. But when you look at the actual data and honest review of the rankings, for NAEP and ACT, what we see is that most of those rankings are in the low to mid-20s. So basically, Kansas is about average, and that's in a nation that really doesn't perform very well on international comparisons. Now, if we look back while these gaps have been increasing, we find that nothing has really changed since 2003, whether we're looking at the NAEP scores or at the ACT scores. There have been a few tiny increases, a few very small declines, but basically not much has changed since 2003. Now the, the state assessment was, a new state assessment was created in 2015, so we don't have trends to share with you there. But we do have some disturbing, again, what I consider to be somewhat disturbing results from that 2015 state assessment. And I wanted to show you how the local districts of Coffeyville and Independence compare with the state average this is the percentage of students in the 10th grade who are on track to be college and career ready. And again, what we see is less than a quarter of the low-income students are on track to be college and career ready, and less than half of the students in the local districts and across the state, less than half of those who are not low-income are on track to be college and career ready. Now, these results may be somewhat hard to believe. I get that. But they're borne out by what we find on the ACT exam where we find that only 32% of the, 
of Kansas students are college ready in English reading, math, and science. And while ACT does not provide income breakouts, we can see that there are still very large achievement gaps between African American students, Hispanic students, and white students in Kansas. Now this has all happened, the, the achievement has flatlined and the gaps have gotten wider, while at the same time we've seen very large funding increases in Kansas. The per pupil spending last year was $13,124 on average, and over the lifespan of the old school funding system, that's a 45% increase above inflation. So why, has, why have outcomes not changed? We've had a large funding increase, and some people, some researchers believe that there is a correlation between spending more money and getting better results. Other researchers don't believe that. They say the data shows otherwise. But here's what you need to know about that. When pressed, the researchers who say they believe there's a correlation will admit that just spending more money doesn't cause anything to change. What they really say is it's how you spend the money. Sure, money makes a difference, but it's how you spend the money that makes the difference, not how much. So let's take a, quick, a couple of quick looks at how some of that money has been spent in Kansas. Nothing, everyone agrees, nothing makes more difference to a student than having an effective teacher in a classroom. And yet since 1993, local school boards in Kansas have hired managers and other non-teachers at five to six times the rate of enrollment change. Here's another example. Over the last 10 years, we've seen funding increased by nearly $2 billion, and yet local school boards have allocated a smaller share of total funding to instruction. In 2015, only 52.9% of total spending was allocated to instruction by local school boards. Now, this is not just a Kansas phenomenon. This notion of this experience of large funding increases and flat achievement. This study from Cato by the late Andrew Colson found that since 1970, school spending adjusted for inflation has nearly tripled, and yet outcomes for 17-year-olds are basically flat. So once you've had an opportunity to review all of this new information and anything else you want to review, it's time to start answering some questions. And the first one is, are these outcomes acceptable? And this is your personal decision. It doesn't, it's not a matter of right or wrong. For example, is it acceptable that only 32% of Kansas students are considered college ready in English reading, math, and science? Is it acceptable to you that low income students are two to three years worth of learning behind their more affluent peers? And is it acceptable that we now have to wait centuries for the current system to play out to close those achievement gaps? Now the next question is if the outcomes are not acceptable today, Will they be in the near future? So if we allow, every, continue to do everything we've done that's gotten us to this point, if we can allow that to play out, will the outcomes be soon acceptable? Now, if your answer to questions one and two are yes, well then it stands to reason that you wouldn't want to change anything. You're pleased with where we are. But if your answer to question one and two is no, then you have to answer the really challenging question. How much how important is the future of education to you? Are you willing to withstand the intense pressure to back off? You see, if you ask the education system to change, you'll soon find that that's not taken very kindly, to put it politely. The pressure to back off from the special interests will be intense, so you have to enter this decision of yours knowing how important the future of education is to you. Now, unfortunately, Efforts to shut down civil discourse of the challenges we face are far too common these days. But if we cannot have civil discussion of our present situation, we can never fully prepare for the future. And with that in mind, I especially want to thank Independence Community College and President Dan Barwick for fostering open civil public discussion of these issues. It needs to take place. Now, I can't promise that any particular change is going to have the same outcomes for all students in Kansas as it did for Jalen. But I can tell you this for sure. If you believe, after your careful review, that we need change in our education system, then you must 
as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Otherwise, the future is going to look more like Yogi Berra's description. It'll be like deja vu all over again. Now, that's just my opinion. You have to make it your own determination after examining all the facts, because really the future of education is in your hands. Thank you.